exhausted, but uh, it's okay. I guess this Hopefully is the someone will make me coffee here. Hopefully, <laughs> it's okay. I'm joking. Maybe the, the Friends of Tehila Friedman organization in the US will send you some coffee. <laughs> so thank you all for joining. I, I think we'll get started. Rabbi Mintz, would you like to say a few words or would you like me to? You, you start and then I'll take it over. Hey, Good. Rabbi Adam. Good to How see are you? Yeah. Nice to see you. So thank you all for joining. My name is Jake Shapiro. I'm speaking on behalf here of the Shacharit Institute. Uh, Shacharit is a synergistic mix of think tank, leadership development center, and community organizing hub that is nurturing a new social partnership among all of Israel's communities and the Jewish diaspora, building a future rooted in the common good. Uh, Shacharit is answering the question, how can diverse citizens in the Jewish world live well together? Uh, we advance a notion of the common good which is the idea that all of the groups in Israel and the diaspora are here and are here to stay. We must find a way to work together to address the pressing issues um, that are present both in Israeli society around the world and in the Jewish diaspora. And we're honored to have Tehila Friedman here with us. Tehila is a longtime Shacharit senior staffer. Uh, she was recently the director of Shacharit's work in the religious Zionist community. Tehila is very much a representation of, of what Shacharit aims to create in Israeli society. Uh, Tehila can speak for herself, but she's someone that holds very strongly her own identity, but is willing to reach out to other parts of Israeli society and to the Jewish diaspora in order to create a society defined by the common good. Um, so we're very excited to be here. Uh, throughout the meeting, I will send some links and uh, some articles things for you to consider. Um, I would love to thank Rabbi Adam Mintz from Kehilat Zorayim Achuvim uh, for helping to organize. And I'd also like to thank the congregations that are joining us, Congregation Beth Abraham Jacob, Ocheb Zedek Tedal, and Beth Congregation. Thank you all so much for joining. I'm really looking forward to this very important conversation. Over to you, Rabbi Adam Mintz. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, and to Hila, it's a real treat to be able to um, to be able to participate in this um, conversation a little bit from afar. We all remember um, the pre-COVID days when you spoke in KRA um, and how um, you really shared so much about what was going on in Israel. Just want to thank again. You thank the Jake. You thank the um, congregations. Want to thank the rabbis. Um, Want to thank Rabbi Roy Feldman from um, Albany. Um, and I want to thank Rabbi Noah Levitt, who I think his face is not on, but he is very much part of the conversation, and Rabbi Gershon Al Albert from, um, from Oakland, California. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. The setup for today will be as follows, and that is that I will start by asking a couple of questions, um, and then after Tila's answers, um, I'll turn it over to the other rabbis who will... Um, who will also um, be able to ask a couple of questions. And if there's time, we'll open it up. And as if you want, over the course of the, um, of the discussion, you can put a question in the chat box and we can, um, we can um, re refer to those questions at the end. Let's start, Tehila, before we get to the election, let's talk about, I think, what everybody in America wants to understand. And that is, what is going on with COVID in Israel? What happened with the airport? Is the airport gonna, gonna open? And when can all of us, whether we're in Oakland, California or on West End Avenue, when are we gonna be able to come visit Israel? Well, that's a question I cannot answer, but um, <laughs> let's go backward. Um, Israel, we are now in the, I hope the last part of our third lockdown. Um, and we are now, I, I think, in the, in, the, in the worst wave of COVID. Um, since January, uh, we had more than 1,200, I think, uh, people who, who died. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, all in all, 4,700. 
um, and those numbers are horrible. Um, now the story with with the airport is is because of those uh, variants, you know, um, um, that we uh, imported from uh, all over the world, um, and 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 I'm making the the situation much much worse because this variant that came from England, um, are hurting kids more than, than before and much more aggressive. Now, what makes it more complicated is that because it's our third time and because the lack of trust and because of the political environment, um, you see that the numbers are not going down. And I'm saying it's because of political environment, it's because of restrictions, people are not, um, People are not disciplined. People are not uh, keeping the rules. Uh, we had today huge funeral of Rabbi Soloveitchik in the streets of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I think there were something like twenty thousand people marching in. Marching is not the, really the word, but uh, walking in in the streets of Jerusalem uh, for this funeral. Now, on one hand, okay, it's opening the air and it's not very different than demonstrations. On the other hand, those people are coming from a community, I'm talking about ultra-orthodoxy, about Haredim, um, that suffer from the highest level of, of COVID. Just to give you a sense of numbers, if you are ultra-orthodox in Israel uh, and you are more than 60, you, the chances you passed away already is one to hundred, one percent already passed away. Okay. In the general community, mm -hmm. you are talking about one to every 2000. Mm -hmm. Just, okay. That's, that's uh, proportions. And when you see this specific community that on one hand suffering from from COVID-19 more than anyone else. And on the other hand, doesn't keep the rules at all. So you ask yourself, how are we gonna get out of it? And, and it's become very, very problematic. I'm not saying that the ultra-Orthodox are the only one to blame. I'm, I'm really not saying that. I'm just saying that right now, uh, we, have, we have big problems there. Um, now it has to do with the airport. Um, because we need to take drastic moves, such as closing our border. Now, think of it, Israel is almost an island because our borders are closed, our land borders, okay, are, are not, we don't use them anyhow, you know, to Egypt, to Jordan. I mean, we are using them, but in a very, um, um, a very few people are using them. So we actually have only one gate and this is the airport. Uh, so it's con we can control it, supposedly. On the other hand, it's first time ever that Israel doesn't let Olim to come in and even Israel Israeli citizens. So obviously we cannot do it for too long. It wouldn't, you know, another two weeks, three weeks, we can't hold it anymore. Um, and I guess the only way to do to, to do, the only way to continue life will be um, find way to make sure that people that need to be, you know, two weeks, um, how do you say, be do the, uh, isolated, um, would keep it. We, we have really big problems with, with keeping the rules. We, we Jews were not, we, we're never very big in keeping rules, I must say, even though we are Lachic people here. Um, we should tell the truth that uh, Jews are not big in uh, being disciplined. We have chutzpah, uh, but um, it's become really a problem now in Israel. So I'm not no. sure I have good news. On, on the other hand, more than 3 million people are always, got, already got the, shot, the first shot. More than a million and a half got two. So hopefully, we should see some impact of it soon. Otherwise, you know, otherwise, what's the point? Um, 
so I guess that's so that that's a good news. But uh, it's mixed, as you see. Okay, we we wish you well, and we're thinking about what's going on in Israel and what's going on in America in terms of COVID. And it should be um, yesterday we read Kenny Hashem Rofecha that that should be um, that should be fulfilled for everybody. But now to move to the election, um, I think we in America don't understand. You know, I guess that's part of the issue when you have so many elections back to back to back. Is this election just another election, just like the past three, that it's a referendum on BB and either he's gonna win and it's gonna be the same or he's gonna lose and there'll be a change? Or is there something different about this election from the past three over the last however many months? Um... I think there is something different, and that's that for the first time he's being challenged from the right and seriously being challenged. And that it's not a two blocks. And that's good news for me. And because I think, look, you are coming from a political system that built on two camps, two blocks. So for you, that's normal. But for Israel, that was, ne that was never the case. You know, our political system is supposed to be built on um, five, six, seven parties uh, that some of them are supposed to build coalition among them. Now, in the last three times, we, it, it didn't work because we had two blocks and it was either or. Now, we in Kahola in blue and white tried to, to break it, okay? We, we, we broke our block and, and we, we, we created the uh, United, United Government, uh, United Government. Well, it didn't work well. <laughs> um, and, and, and now, instead of, of it being, you know, two people, uh, Gans versus Bibi, you have Sa'ar, and you have Bennett from the right, and you have Lapid. So he's been he's being uh, Prime Minister Bibi is is being challenged from both sides, and um, and and so that's different, I think. Um, hopefully, hopefully that would work. It will make, but it would make the coalition um, building more, much more complicated. Because think of situation that Sa'ar has more people who recommend him to be prime minister, for example, okay? But those people are from the right and from the left. You know, it can be Lapid and Meretz and Labour Party and the Arabs and Bennett. And so, so how would he build a coalition from that? It's, it, it's not going to be easy. Um, I hope it will be possible because to think about another election. Look, we are in a in a in a very very deep crisis. Very deep crisis. Our political system doesn't function. It's broken. It just doesn't function. Um, it's going to need a serious recovery. I don't think this recovery can be done as long as Netanyahu is a prime minister. Uh, because he is in in conflict of interest, in turn, you know, inherent conflict of interest. It's all the time his personal interest versus the national interest for stability, for budget, for you know, um, for everything that country need. Um, and as long as he's there, I think we'll we'll see this instability over and over and over. Um. How, I mean, on that kind of pessimistic note, as Jews living in America, what are the issues that we should be looking at over the next two months that are going to decide the election? Is it all about COVID? Is it all about Iran? Is it about something else? What it, what's the election about and what should we be kind of keeping our eyes on? <laughs> That's a very good question. What's those elections about? Yeah, a lot of it's going to be around COVID. Um, it's a good question. Is the Iranian deal going to become central? 
it, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think it's going to be. What's interesting is that what I described before about the ultra orthodox and the you know close connection to Netanyahu and and the Likud becomes a serious issue, um, a serious problem uh, for for Netanyahu, um, because there is great anger in Israel right now, and not only anger but frustration, feeling that what was true for you know small minority. Uh, what Israel could allow small minority cannot go on like that when you speak about one million point two. Um, it's you know it's a it's a it's a huge group, and and that that live in a, in autonomy in many ways, but it's not really autonomy because it rely on on you know the hospitals and the economy and the you know uh, and the security. Of all the others, uh, you know, we the country provide armies, the country provide hospitals, the country provide everything, and 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 yet, you know, it's autonomy and they are making their own rules. So that's become a real problem. Not why I know it's a problem, because for first time after many years, last week the political main uh, story was our blue and white. Uh, um, we demand to change the law in a way that we um, would enable us to close uh, um, schools immediately, to close schools that uh, um, that are open in, 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 in lockdown. Now, you would think that's obvious, but um, it wasn't the situation, the legal situation. Uh, and, and we demand to change the law. And it was a whole battle because the ultra orthodox party uh, refused, and at the end, the Likud had to say, "Okay, blue and white are right. We'll take the position." And they didn't do it because the blue eyes of Gantz. They did it because it's become a real problem, uh, and they felt that that even among right wings today, 52 percent are in favor for government without the ultra orthodox parties. That's very new, very new. Um, so, so that's an issue that is raising. And also I think the notion of, of chaos. Someone asked without what? I said, what I said is without the ultra-Orthodox parties. Um, Yaduta Torah and Shas. Um, now, now, another thing is, that the notion of chaos, the notion that um, instability, that's something that bother people. It's around the COVID, but not only the COVID. Um, so, so that's that's another issue. It's not. I I know it sounds. It's not the Iranian deal. It's not. You know. It's not the typical issues. But I think that's what makes it. Um, those are the new. If if you ask what the new trends, those are the new trends. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question, then I'll pass it on to the other rabbis. One of the questions in the chat to Hila had to do with how is this election going to be different than the previous three, in which BB won, and at least in America, the thinking was that Trump was very helpful to BB. How is the change in the American government going to affect the upcoming Israeli election? First, I want to say he didn't win. He didn't win. Uh, the last three, um, he wasn't able to to become prime minister, um, or or to become a prime minister he wanted to, uh, to be. Um, now, what's the effect of Biden? It could go to two different directions. One, and that's something which keeping me medil shename uh, night, keeping me. Waking in nights. I don't know what the expression. I I guess you have this expression in English. Um, he can take it to be, you know, I'm strong. Uh, um, I'm and I'm the only one who can confront Biden, who's exactly like Obama, and you know, a danger for Israel. That's that's can happen, and that's horrible. Um. And and it can be 
it, it, it can work to the other direction. I already heard Dani Dayaz, our previous uh, Consul General saying, you know, Netanyahu is not able to work with the Democratic Party, uh, Gidon Sao would be able. So maybe it would be for the fa in favor of, of Saar, but it can also be in favor of, of Netanyahu if he will decide to, to, to profile Biden as an enemy. I just, I wish, I wish I knew he wouldn't be irresponsible to do it. I wish, I don't know, I hope. Um, okay, so thank you, Tila. I'm, I'm going to pass it on to the other rabbis. Maybe they're going to get a more optimistic answer from you on some of the questions. We'll start all the way on the on the West Coast. And I know, Tila, that you spoke in Rabbi Albert Shul in Oakland. So Rabbi Gershon Albert, take it away. I'm, I'm very, I, I must say that usually I'm, a, I'm an optimistic. And also now I'm optimistic because I, I do think we can create a change. So... I will try to express my optimism more clearly. <laughs> They're more optimistic in California than in New York, so it's okay. You can start with the mail. Well, we try. Um, the sun sets later here. Uh, well, thank you so much to Javier Knesset, uh, Tila Friedman, and it's uh, really nice to connect with you. Again, we had a conversation among a group of rabbis uh, about a month ago, and really wonderful to talk with you. I think you... It was January 2020, right? Uh, um, you... No, I came to Auckland in October, I think, something like that. Okay, 2019. So um, thank you for being here and joining with us. I, I guess I have a two-part question for you, and, that, and then I'll pass it on to some of the other rabbis and, and individuals here on the call. And it really centers around your advice or your, your thoughts about how to create connection during a time of disconnection. Uh, I think I've seen this in my, my own experience personally. Um, I used to check Times of Israel multiple times a day. It was one of my like news stops. And during COVID when life has become more stressful and I'd say even you know local and national issues have become much more at the top of my mind, it, I, I noticed myself checking Israeli news less frequently. And I imagine the same thing is true in Israel, that um, Israelis who are struggling, as you, you just highlighted some of the incredible struggles that Israel is going is experiencing with COVID now in the third lockdown, um, I guess in parallel, but separate to American Jewry struggles. I'm curious, for those of us who care about Israel, uh, and I think everyone on this call uh, by definition would fall into that category. So my first part is, you know, how would you encourage us to keep that connection? during this time? It's interesting if it's, uh, I mean, I believe you that you are checking uh, uh, the Israeli news less frequently. On the other hand, I'm thinking uh, um, about myself because of the Zoom, I had the opportunity to meet so many groups and so many people from abroad, uh, much more than in any other year. So there is something about this time, which is on one hand, we are very local, local in terms of, you know, the people that I see the most are my neighbors, much more than my parents, my siblings, my neighbors become, you know, very important in my life. On the other hand, it doesn't matter if you live in Tel Aviv or New York, it's the same Zoom. So, so it enabled me to have connections and, and conversation with people that usually, you know, I'm, my mindset was that they're far, you know, it's more complicated. And so that's one thing. The other, um, in the first lockdown, the discourse in Israel in uh, around what's happening in diaspora communities and how Israel is able to help um, was uh, raised. It was interesting. It was, uh, um, it was first time that people understood that, you know, after years that Israel was a project of the Jewish people, maybe it's time that the Jewish people would be the project of Israel. And that's because I think in the first wave, we were in, in better situations than, than many other places. And because Jewish communities really were hitted very badly. Um, now, 
now it's a little different because it's already a year. And as you say, we're all very focused internally. Um, and yet I think something there, um, something something new started. I, I, I had people um, that were never involved in, in this issue of Israel diaspora connections, becoming you know more interested, more involved, more committed, um, and and that was that was very positive. I think people understood in Israel understood um, the Jewish life. Um, in Israel, Jewish life are public part of public life and public. Uh, you know, it's paid by our taxes. And just to understand that Jewish life is volunt on a voluntarily basis and, and paid paid after you pay your taxes, uh, paid from your netto, uh, that's that's it, that was new for people. All all the, the discourse around the corona just taught people things that they never thought of uh, and enables them, you know, to to see things that they just didn't know, really didn't know. Uh, so it's it, it really open it opened channels that were closed before. That's that's beautiful, and I think that certainly is more optimistic than the, the so last. So you see, you did your job. <laughs> um, I guess as a as and this was part one of my question for you, and I, I hope the uh, probably the easier one, just as an extension of that. Are there any, now that we're living so much of our lives digitally, as you said, on, in a Zoom room or um, on social media, are there any important voices that you think we should be looking to as kind of emerging leaders or, um, or current leaders who we should be paying attention to to understand, to kind of deepen our understanding of life in Israel and the trends that Israelis are facing? Obviously, but are you talking about political voices, about... Um, Spiritual, educational, I mean, yeah, maybe no, because if, no, really, I, because really, it's, it's a good question. First, I, I, I'm always uh, frustrated by um, the, the shallow look. You know, for years, I felt that the Jews outside of Israel. Uh, looks at Israel only through the the perspective of the conflict or, um, you know the the, the right versus, right left uh, um, discourse, uh, and the Israeli society is so much richer and and complicated. Um, so so I think what you're offering is very true. Uh, the more we understand, and and by the way, it's true also. The opposite, okay. We 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 tend to look on Amer on, on American jury. If, if we look on American jury, and, you know, um, those of us who, who are interested, um, mainly through um, um, the, the question, the religious, you know, the reform movement, like they are all reforms. They are all. We picture uh, um, American Jewry as as if it's all the same, and it's ridiculous, uh, and and we, we really don't understand it enough. So I think to deeper our uh, understanding of, of of each other, that's really the most important uh, move we, we we can do. And the only problem is the language, because. And no, really, it's it's really a serious problem because I guess you can follow Hebrew pretty easily, and, but most people can't. And it's true, vice versa. We know so little about, you know, things that are just Jewish literature in in the state, Jewish, um, Jewish thought, uh, and and a lot of it has to do with the language. So. So that's really a challenge. Now I can give you a long list of, of people that uh, you know worth following, um, but again, it has to do with language. So yeah, it, 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 I, I think that uh, if I need to give a list of people who write in English, it would be much shorter. Maybe we could start. If on the top of the of your head you have any ideas, who who are people who are 
deepening that conversation who do write in English, if you have any in, on my, in your mind, and maybe we can follow up with you after, um, who are deepening the, the cultural conversation, the social conversation, the kind of social structure conversation and the political conversation. That's, that's interesting. I would, I would think of two, maybe three. One is my colleague, a, a member of the Knesset, Michal kotler Wunsch. Um, she's extremely active um, in, in, in Israel diaspora relations and also in, in New Orleans. She, she came from Canada herself. She's the daughter of Erwin Kotler. Um, oh. Was, he was, uh, was a yeah, foreign he was a member of parliament in the neighborhood I grew up in in Montreal. So now, also I think he was Minister of Justice. He was, um, yeah. So she's one voice. Another voice is someone called Dr. Ilan Ezrahi from Jerusalem. Um, his wife is the head of Hebrew Union College in, in Jerusalem, but he himself is a um, He's a Jerusalemite activist, and he's just someone I find his his way of thinking interesting. Um, I can think about other rabbis, but you know that's something. That maybe that's something we need to develop. It's interesting. Maybe we need to think about how we bring just translation. I, I once I was trying to convince Hartman Institute. By the way, Hartman. A lot of a lot of work is done by Hartman. But but maybe 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 what we should do is just translate once a week. You know, interesting articles from both sides. Just just to give a sense of, of what's happening. Um, and and that can that can be a breakthrough. Um, well, you gave me an idea. I need to think how to do it. Sure. So that was the low hanging fruit part of the question. Um, the other part of the question I, I'd share is from Sof Marav, the ends, the ends of the West. Um, we're living in an, uh, in an age now where people's uh, values, you know, sometimes that can translate to progressive or conservative values, you know, really become the lens through which they see the entire world. And I'd say particularly living here um, is among young people um, in, in the Bay Area, and I imagine this is true in other parts of the country as well. I've certainly heard this from college students around the country. Um, there seems to be an increasing apathy about Israel. And I think it's connected to the perception that anything that's not 100% aligned with progressive values um, cannot be something that young people endorse or support. Um, I see that increasingly where um, I, I don't know that young Jews are becoming anti-Israel, uh, but I think there are more and more young Jews who just don't see Israel as existentially important or, or in line with their own progressive values. So I'm curious to hear from your standpoint for, you know, at least those of us living in what sometimes can be, feel like an uber progressive environment. You know, San Francisco just decided to rename 44 of its schools, including a, a school named after Abraham Lincoln, uh, because Abraham Lincoln, you know, was a slave owner. Um, so living in this area where people are so quick to cancel anything that is not 100% in line with their values, and then, you know, of course, for some for some young people, Israel's conflict with the Palestinians is just an issue that they basically let, leads them to canceling Israel as a value of theirs. Ha, what suggestions would you have? Because I, th I think that is an existential crisis for the diaspora Jewish community. Um, it's interesting because you put it uh, uh, on the context of Israel, but it's actually also the political internal question of America. I mean, not being able to listen and understand the perspective, the conservative small C uh, perspective is also what, what created the political crisis you were in and maybe still in, I think still in. Um, and, and to understand that um, there is a value, there is really a value in, in, it's not only, you know, respecting the other, it's also understanding that there is a set of values um, that by understanding you can gain something, you can, those people are not stupid. 
there, there, there's, there's reason why people believe in something. There is reason why people are loyal to it. It's, it understand listening to it and reaching your existence. Um, and it's true also for Israel. Um, the sense of collective that exists so so hard, so strongly in Israel uh, also holds strong solidarity, also holds um, some kind of, of belongness to, to 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 tradition. I mean, for me, it's so obvious that that you know when you don't hold both, um, you are missing something. That's something. That's that's what Shacharit is all about. I must say, and um, that's the big project. If you if you're looking for something to follow in Israel, Shacharit is is a great place to 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 start from because. That's the whole point of Shacharit, to, to understand that the different voices, um, the different perspectives, and, and, and holding, not choosing between liberal values to, to conservative values, but holding both uh, um, enrich the conversation, enriching life, enrich politics, uh, and enable you to create new political covenants uh, that otherwise you wouldn't be able to, to promote what you want to promote. That's a whole project of Shacharit. And, and, and for me, I don't want to be rude, but there is something so childish in, 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 in you know, thinking that those, you know, all those people are just stupid and, and, and we need to live in some some pure uh, world, and we're gonna, you know, deny those the names and deny the history and deny. I mean, I don't know. I'll tell you one story. Okay, when my first one became twelve, she became bat mitzvah. We had to decide what kind of bat mitzvah we we're gonna do. Now, on one hand, I wanted her to learn. I didn't as a kid. Um, obviously, and and I wanted her uh, to read and to to learn. On the other hand, I wanted my parents to come, um, and I wanted both. Um, it was as important to me as you know to do it in the way I want. Uh, so we found the solution. We did it in a, a woman minion, and we had mechitza. And my father and, and brothers, you know, sit behind the mechitza. I thought it was a very educational experience for them, uh, and and we found a way that was not hundred percent pure for any side, but it was something. It was doable. We could, everyone could, you know, live with it, and um, and I didn't feel I'm compromising. I I felt that I wanna. I want to win both. I want to be. I want to have my family. I want to be truth to my. I want to feel, you know, I, that I'm not breaking the chain on one hand, and I wanted to do it in in you know to promote the values I want to promote. So, so not either or, but holding both. That's, you know, that's to be for me. That's to be adult. Excuse me, can someone please mute the children and the dogs? It's very hard to hear her. Thank you. Yes, the only thing is that those are my children and my dog. That's a problem. Now I'm trying to mute them. Believe me, but it's hard. So hopefully they will be more quiet. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. And I, I would just say that. <laughs> Thank you, Shaka. Um, as a parent with young kids at home, who's also spending a lot of my day on Zoom, I, I feel the struggle. Um, I, I just would say that that kind of thinking is something that I think um, Am Yisrael in general, but particularly right now living in the diaspora, we need more of. And um, it, it's inspiring me to think that, you know, as part of one important ingredient in Israel advocacy uh, for us going forward is to strengthen that culture of being able to hold 
uh, multiple perspectives and truths. And so it's exciting to see what Shafrit is doing and to get more involved as well. So thank you. I'll pass it on to the next rabbi. Okay. Um, thank you, Rabbi Albert, uh, so much uh, for, for passing it on. And thank you so much to Jake and Shacharit and to Rabbi Mintz for organizing it, and especially to member of Knesset Tehillah Friedman for allowing us this opportunity to have a conversation with you. Um, I actually like to, if, if you don't mind, ask a completely different kind of a question um, about your experiences uh, as, a, as a modern Orthodox member of, as a religious Zionist member of Knesset. Um, and my, my specific question is that um, it's now been just about 15 or so years yeah. since the solution of the Mafdal, of the religious Zion, the National Religious Party. No, not um, yet. And now there, there no longer is a, um, there no longer is a, a special interest party that is there to look for the interests of the religious Zionist community. There is such a party for almost every other faction in Israel, right? Yadut Torah and Degel Torah. Th these aren't really right-wing political parties. They're Haredi parties. Whatever the Haredi interests are, that's what they're going to represent. If it happens to align right or left, it happens to align right or left. Um, but it, without, but it, you know, what, what does it reflect on the religious Zionist community that there isn't such a party? And what have been the, are, are there regrets, so to speak? I know that by the end, Mafdal was really a right-wing party also. So it's not really accurate, but for decades, it wasn't. For decades, it was just a special interest party. Um, what does it reflect about that community? And are, what are the pros and cons um, you know, for, for the, for the, uh, for the religious Zionist community. And are there any regrets? Are there, is there a feeling of unity between you and the other religious members of the other parties who kind of have to look out for those interests? I don't, I don't know what all those interests are. I'm a modern Orthodox Jew living in America, but, but are, you know, is there, is there something missing that there isn't such a special interest party going on right now? But now I'm curious. You need to tell me where you studied in Israel. Oh, I studied with Rabbi Sherlo in Yeshivat Petach Tikva. Okay. Because something told me that you are not really in Shalabim or Kerem Deavne. Um, okay, so. First, I'm um, very, very much against uh, sectorial parties. I think that's one of the deepest sickness okay. of Israel politics. Um, and comparing, I mean, the ultra-Orthodox party is the greatest example for that. I, the damage for the, you know, political, the damage for the, to, for promoting common goods because of sectorial mm -hmm. parties is obvious, okay? Sectorial parties are looking to uh, maximize the interest of certain group, okay? To, to put it simple, to get more money to my kids um, than to others. That's just immoral, okay? I mean, my kids are great, noisy, and, but great. But there is no reason uh, for, the, for the education to be supported uh, uh, by the government more than any other kids. And that's reality, actually. The, the more than orthodox schools are supported by governmental money more than any other sector in Israel. Because for years we had those parties that that was our interest, you know, to take care of our school, of our youth movement, Nakiva, of our, you know, interest. Now, I mean, that's immoral. And, and also religiously, I mean, we, we believe in Hizaru Vivna Niim Kimem Tetzetora. Okay, where, it, where it's written that, you know, our kids are more important than any, anyone else. I mean, I think about the Talmud, the Talmud, a beautiful story about Rabbi Yoshua ben Gamla, Zachur Oto Aish Latov, Ken, Rabbi Yoshua ben Gamla, who, uh, uh, who created really a public education. Um, I, I, I will do horrible job uh, translating the, the Talmud, but I'll tell the story, okay, in, in, uh, in short, uh, the Talmud describe how first a mitzvah is for every uh, parents to teach his kids. 
But then they saw that not every parent can teach, is able to teach. So the Levine were the teachers, but in every city. But then, and no, no, first they sent the kids to, to Jerusalem, and then not every family can send the kids. And then they decided that in every city, there will be a school for every kid. So, so that's a Jewish ethos for me, you know, taking care for, for everybody. How come that we, you know, in the name of the Torah, are taking care of our kids um, and not looking on the common good? So that's, that's my, you know, that's my moral uh, uh, position. Politically, I also think that there is not enough, religious Zionism in Israel today is so diverse within it, okay? We have people who are, I, I'm thinking about, you know, people who would fight for, for, for the rights of women and people who would be extremely conservative for that. People who would be, uh, um, for and against, um, you know, LGBT rights and people who would be for and against uh, uh, having the chief rabbinate controlling all the religious services and people who would be for and against. I can think of almost every issue aside of the question of the territories that I need to be fair and say that more than 90% of, of religious Zionism is right wing when it comes to, you know, question of settlements and, and territories. But every other question, you, you can find great diversity within religious Zionism. So, so how can you be one, you know, how can you have one party when you have such a diversity within it? Um, in Shacharit, I led a, a, a project of um, religious Zionist uh, leadership. Um, that's how I got to Kehilat Reima Uvim. We came, we spent Shabbat in New York. Um, it was extremely interesting for, to see um, the process they, you know, the people went through. For most of them, it was first time to, um, to a, to really understand the Aspergerian, and to understand the streams, and it was interesting. Anyhow, I, it, the point was to create this notion of, of working for the common good. We called it a, a solidarity a, from from Shivtiut, from tribe. No way I can I pronounce that. From tribe and uh, from tribalism to solidarity. Uh, thank you, Jake. Um, so to, to get out from the notion of, of tribe and to, you know, brother, you look uh, to Klal Israel, really Klal Israel. Um, now we built on the base and that's, that's something interesting. We, ne we didn't build on pluralism. This is not pluralistic community and I don't think it would ever be. But this community, um, is very much built on the Torah of Rav Kook and on the notion of Klal Israel. But somehow we need to understand that Klal Israel is really broad. Klal Israel is not imagining that one day will come and everyone would look like us. No, Klal Israel is to understand that this is reality, this is Am Israel, and, and this is the Israeli society, not all of us are Jews. And, and if you feel responsible for Klal Israel, you have to be really responsible for Klal Israel. And, and moving from pluralism to solidarity, I felt that's, that's a way to create this notion of, um, you know, stop, not to think like a sector. I hope I answered the question. I'm not sure, but I hope. Yeah, absolutely. Are are there any are there any negative aspects to it? Do you find that there are? Is there any regret? I mean, just last week, I think there was an advertisement. I think um, member of Knesset Smotrich is now advertising that he's the new unified religious party. So clearly, there is some. There clearly there are some people that want 
that think that there is marketing value to having those, um, to having that kind of, um, that kind of unified voice, even whether or not it really is unified, but he's projecting, that's what he's projecting as his, uh, you know, as the tagline for the, um, for the party. So is, are, are there, are there regrets communally or is it kind of, you know, religious Zionists are now part of Israeli society, secular, uh, you know, regular Israeli society. And now there's no, there's really no utility to, to such a, to such a voice. What, I mean, what. I, I, I think it's, it's something also generational uh, uh, question. I'm thinking about my parents. So for them, you know, so who's going to take care of our schools? <laughs> uh, so that's, and, and also there is kind of missing this feeling of unity and, you know, um, we're all part of the same something. Um, so so the, it's kind of sentiment more than a, more than ideology. Um, and and I, I'm smiling because you know to think that Smotrich is representation of religious Zionism in, in, in Israel, that's that's almost ridiculous. I mean Smotrich is a very far right end of religious Zionism. Unfortunately, he become more and more a powerful, um, and I'm saying unfortunately because as much as I respect him personally, I oppose his values uh, hardly. Um, racism, sometime um, chauvinism, big time. I mean, uh, really, it really is a very far uh, uh, right end. I must say to his credit. He doesn't think that he represents the whole sector at all. Um, he thinks he can create a list that would represent enough of it. Um, and he thinks it's still important. And yes, that's a dispute. That's a big machloket between me and him. Uh, are we supposed to be part of the Israeli society with our special, I'm not opposing the identity. I'm sending my kids to Mamlachtidati school, to Nakiva, to, you know, I'm very much part of this community, of this sector. I just think that it shouldn't be translated politically. I mean, the fact that you are, um, um, part of a community and not every community need to have a party. It's a political word and the community award are not the same. Um, Rabbi Feldman, ask one more question then pass it on to Rabbi Levitt. I'm gonna pass it on to Rabbi Levitt now, thank you. Great, Rabbi Levitt, take it away. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for speaking with us today. And uh, you should know that every time your dog barks, my dog barks as well. So, um, <laughs> It's not just people that Zoom is connecting, it's, it's uh, our dogs as well. <laughs> um, I, I was wondering, picking up on what Rabbi Feldman was asking about um, parties that represent specific sectors, it seems like now uh, that the, the Arab community is in a different place in this election than they have been in previous elections. I don't remember uh, BB courting the Arab vote ever before. Uh, is the are is this election going to be different in terms of uh, who uh, Israeli Arabs vote for, and is that a bright spot in terms of um, building building bridges between the Israeli Arab sector and the rest of Israeli society, or is this just a political ploy? Um. Okay, here I can be really optimistic because I do think that we're seeing a, a shift. Um, are Arabs going to vote differently? I think that's what polls show. Um, but here I'm not 100% sure. What I am 100% sure is that there is a shift in the Israeli uh, mindset and it's not a taboo anymore. To cooperate with the uh, Arab uh, parties and and with the uh, Arab citizens, and that's extremely important, extremely. And that's 
really beautiful example of mishum shelo lishma ba lishma. Because Netanyahu doesn't do it because he really, you know, one morning become a supporter of a, of civil discourse, of, of a, you know, equal, equal rights to, to Arabs and, and so on and so forth. He, he does it because he understands he somehow needs to bring, you know, more voters and, and, and that he, he desperately needs them. But by doing it, he really created something very, very important. Now, we knew for years now, we really know it, and in Shacharit specifically, we have serious research about it. We know that within the Arab uh, society, there is strong trend of Israelization. Okay, people who want to be better integrated into the Israeli society. And the Abraham uh, uh, peace uh, agreements um, also created something interesting because it changed, you know, all of a sudden the Arabs who are not Palestinian, that we, you know, create relationship with them and it broke the, you know, our Palestinian, um, um, no, uh, up till then, Jews thought of Arabs as Palestinian. It was, you know, the same. Now it's not the same. So those, I mean, things are happening uh, in this field of Jew Jewish uh, Arabs relation in Israel. And I think those things are positive. Um, I don't know how it's going to be reflected in those elections, but but we, we it will be reflected. I mean, we'll see. It opened possibility to to build coalitions with Arabs that didn't exist before. Okay, I just want to thank you, everybody. I just want to one question from the audience. Rabbi Howie Zach had a question, and then we will close it um, just at one o'clock. Um, Rabbi Zach. Thank you. Um, Shalom, uh, Tahila. Thank you so very much for being with us. Um, I just want to know, following your uh, phenomenal, inspiring inaugural address uh, that we all uh, were, were so moved by, I just want to know, did you find from within the Knesset that there was a positive response to this open up support to more dialogue, to talk about the common good? Or did the COVID and the politics just kind of get it passed without, without being an opportunity? Was an opportunity gained or an opportunity missed? Um, I, I'm not sure I know. I mean, because both is true. And I think some of the people think that I'm extremely naive. And this is not the way politics works. Um, and some are very open and positive for, um, for it. And I think it's a, it's a reflection. Look, generally in society, I think the biggest machloket, the biggest dispute, the biggest rip is not between secular and, and really and from or observance or Jews and Arabs. The biggest split is between people who think that, who believe in common good and believe that the biggest challenge of us is creating shared society versus people who believe that they can win all the others and you know if they try enough um all the others just or disappear or become like them or somehow i don't know give up and you can see it in every sector really every sector so so you can see it also in the Knesset. I can think, aside of Yadut Torah, that they really, really didn't find partners, but even in Shas and Israel Beitenu and in the Arabs parties. And I mean, in each and every party, I could find partners. I found partners for this vision of, of politics of common good. And I found people who are opposing it strongly. So, and I think it's an honest reflection on, on this 
on the challenge of how we create a covenant, bridge and metunim, a covenant between the moderate people from all the sectors. Uh, we're not there yet. It, it's going to take uh, different leadership, but I think that's a vision. <laughs> I think, Tila, that is the perfect way to end on a totally optimistic point. And I think we all share your commitment to working together for the common good. And we appreciate that you are in many ways taking that leadership role in Israel. And we appreciate the fact that you came to speak to American jury today from, um, from New York, from, from Manhattan to Albany to Cleveland to Oakland and all the way back to Katamon. So um, we really, we really appreciate it. And thank you so much. Thank you, Shacharit, for arranging this dialogue. And please, God, it should be the first of many such conversations we should have. Thank you, everybody, for taking. I know it's not a football Sunday, the first non-football Sunday in a long time. So thank you, everybody, for taking a non-football Sunday and coming together and hearing about fighting for the, for the common good. Thank you, Tehila. Thank you, Shacharit. And thank you, everybody. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you.